Hey everyone, this is Dave from the Adobe Character Animator team and recently I made a short cartoon called Consoles. It's about uh, what if the video game consoles were robots and uh, they're, they share an apartment and uh, they have to pay rent and make fun of each other for their different specs and all of that. And uh, I think it turned out pretty well and it got a really good reception um, from you all. So thank you for watching. And one of the number one comments I got though was how the heck did you make this? Uh, people want to make cartoons with multiple characters and a lot of the tutorials I've shown are one character at a time, explainer videos, that sort of thing. So in this video, we're gonna go really deep into a multi-character cartoon workflow. We're gonna start with uh, you know the basics of putting a general overview and script together. We're then gonna move into Adobe Audition and mixing all the audio and exporting for lip sync. In Character Animator, we'll talk about the recording process, how to do all those quick hand movements and triggers uh, for uh, the different hand positions and eyelids and all of that stuff. And then finally, we will composite in Adobe After Effects and add motion blur, shadows, cameras, title screens, credits, all of that. So hopefully by the time you've watched this whole thing, you will also be ready to make your own multi-character, uh, three-minute animated short cartoon to put out there into the world. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's get started. So before I jump into things with a project like this, I want to kind of create a Bible for it, right? I want to I want to create a guiding uh, sense of where everything's going. Uh, so in this case, what's the premise? Who are the characters? What's the world they're living in? Who's the intended audience of these videos? Um, all of that. And so I just started up a Google Doc and just started to write down a few things about that. And uh, then I started to sketch out the characters. And uh, you know, I just did this on my iPad on a, in Adobe Fresco, uh, which I'm going to be using quite a lot during this whole process. And uh, just started. You know, think of some differences. How could I visually differentiate all the characters? So there's a lot. There's a lot of different form factors. Um, all the mouths are actually different. Uh, the eyes are different. This is just something that you know the ideas were stuck in my head, and I didn't really realize what was working and what wasn't working until I got them out there into words or sketches or you know whatever works for you. So um, I just think get those ideas out, uh, good or bad, edit them and get them to where you feel really good about them and you feel like you can move forward. Forward. Uh, I also started to write out, you know, character descriptions and who I wanted to be the voice actors to each one, what differentiates each character, right? So in a, you know, a classic comedy like Seinfeld or Friends or something like that, all the characters are very different and have different personalities. And that's where a lot of the comedy comes from. And so I tried to establish that um, with these characters as well. And it doesn't have to be, you know, really long. It can just be really short character sketches. And then uh, that, you know, as you write scripts and build the characters uh, and the voice actors will bring their own personalities to things, um, you can kind of see how that how that evolves. Now, part of this planning process was thinking about what the actual scene and environment is going to look like. So again, another quick sketch in Adobe Fresco of where the characters were going to be, uh, what's the general layout, um, you know, so in this scene, for example, Switch is going to walk in from the left and jump on the couch. PC comes in from the right. I wanted to just feel like a normal apartment with, you know, a fridge and a counter and fruit and a plant and all these different elements. Um, just kind of getting a sense of what this scene is going to be. And if you had multiple scenes, you could draw out multiple environments. But for me, um, this is a short three minute cartoon. It all takes place in one area. And so I just drew that out um, as a guide as well. And then below here, I wrote the script and uh, again, trying to stay true to each character and uh, having a lot of direction here for uh, each of them about uh, to the voice actors about how they would be saying things. I color coded everything. So when I sent this as a link to the different voice actors, they would have this and be able to isolate their lines a little bit better. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stage direction of, you know, when Switch, you coming in through the left door, uh, just trying to give as many uh, kind of uh, hints and, and organization and guidance to the process um, just to make it easier for everybody, easier for me when I'm animating things later on, easier for the voice actors to know what frame of mind they're in um, and all that stuff. Okay, so I send the script to the different voice actors. They send me back audio files, and uh, usually there's you know two or three takes per line. So I've got a few different choices, and then uh, I open it up here in Adobe Audition. And so uh, here I would go through and listen, and basically save an edited version. So I would open up the audio file and listen to you know let's say these are five takes of the same line, and say okay, actually this one I'm gonna press delete uh, is the best line. So I'm just gonna do this and let's move on to the next one and listen to these. Okay, this one sounds good. So I just keep going through this process of listening and deleting um, until I've kind of got a perfect mix of these are, these are the best takes 
of each line. And then I'm gonna save this as its own uh, document. And once you've done that, you can click this little button up here, insert into multi-track, and that is new multi-track session, and that's going to bring it into uh, a multiple track setup so you can mix all your different voices and music and sound effects together. And that looks something like this. So this is a multi-track setup where every character's voice is its own track. So I've got PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, PC, some background music, uh, some sound effects down here, but basically all laid out uh, as their, their separate individual tracks. And then I can change you know, the volume of them, I can change um, some settings, equalizing. Uh, you can get as complicated or as simple as you want uh, during this part. The basic idea I feel like is you just want the voices to be as clear as possible, have the background music add to the atmosphere but not be too overpowering, add the sound effects to kind of punctuate certain moments. This is where like uh, he's doing the Mario jump in the uh, cartoon. So I had the little boing and the coin sound uh, there, um, just things like that. So if I was starting from the beginning, I would you know bring in one of those edited tracks that I did. So let's just drag this in, something like this. And then I would use the razor tool up here. You wanna make sure it's to selected clips and not razor all clips tool, um, razor selected clips. And then I would uh, zoom in here by pressing plus and I would listen and say, okay, here is where I wanna cut it and cut it and just make these little cuts and you know, delete the sections that I don't need and then move them around to have the timing match up with the other tracks. So how I'm spending most of my time here is kind of listening to these different tracks and making small adjustments. So, okay, this needs to be a little earlier, this needs to be a little later, um, you know, just making little, little changes. So sometimes I'll break a track into half if I feel like there's, you know, too long of a pause here um, between, you know, a moan or a sigh and something else and so I'll bring them closer together. Um, so you, you just have a lot of options here. Basically, I wanna keep the pace kind of fast and uh, always having a forward momentum. And so I tried to make the lines really uh, line up one right after the other. Also play around with volume a lot. So for example, Andrew's track came in a little bit quieter than some of these other tracks. And so I brought, uh, you know, there's this master volume control over here. So I just bumped that up um, two decibels. Um, the sound effects were definitely need to be quieter in the background. So I brought, the, brought those down negative 10. And you've got some on, um, you know, on track controls here, like the, the music fading in and out at the beginning. Um, if you just click these little things, you can make these little lines and dots that will allow you to make the volume rise and fall very easily. Um, make sure to do it on the volume and not the pan. This will make it go from the left ear to the right ear, and that's not what you wanna do. You wanna do it um, with the volume. Audition also has these nice little fader controls that you can drag at the beginning and end of a clip um, to kind of fade it in and out. So really easy to, you know, if there's white space or white noise um, at the beginning or end, you can kind of fade in and out each clip to make sure um, you're not going to have that. So next, I need to take each audio track and export it out by itself to help drive the lip sync of each animated character that I'm using. So let's start with PlayStation at the top, for example. So what I would do is mute all these other tracks so I only want to be hearing um, the top PlayStation track, and then I would export this out. I also wanna make sure that any processing I've done to it um, I would take off temporarily. So I added in the essential sound panel over here, I always add a uh, podcast voice or balanced male voice or something like that to make it sound a little bit cleaner and more professional. But when you're driving lip sync and character animator, I find it works best with just raw audio files. So for, temporarily, I'm gonna clear the audio type to get rid of that. So I just have the raw audio signal. And then I would go to file, export, multi-track mix down, entire session and save that as a uh, AIF file or WAV file or whatever somewhere. By the way, a shortcut to do this at the same time to mute multiple tracks is over the M. If you hold down Command Shift on Mac or Control Shift on Windows and click the M, that's going to make them all mute or unmute at the same time. So I would then do the exact same process for uh, each track exporting each individually. And then I want to also export out a final mix with everything unmuted, everything with whatever processing or EQ you've done to it, uh, all of that stuff, and just export this out. This is going to be your final audio track, mixing the music and the sound effects and the vocals together. Next, let's move on to art production. So uh, I've kind of divided into four different sections when I'm thinking of all the art that I need to create for a given cartoon. So first I've got my characters. Uh, in this case, we've got four different individual characters that I got to you know, create and have all their eye expressions and hand positions and all of that stuff. 
the title and credit screens. Usually this is what's going to start and end the whole cartoon and, you know, give credit to everyone who helped you uh, make this particular production and kind of draw the viewer in. Um, background, midground, and foreground elements. So not just the background, the, the world they're living in, but different things like foreground elements and play things you can hide characters behind to give it kind of a sense of depth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. And props and special effects. So little things that the characters interact with or little smoke bursts or motion lines or things like that that uh, help add a little bit of a dynamic quality to the scene. So I've recorded hours and hours of tutorial about the character side of things, but uh, for this tutorial, I wanted to shine a spotlight on the other elements of production and uh, what all these other elements that really help bring a uh, full package to life. So let's start with the title and credit screens. Um, here I am in Photoshop and I've got my title screen and uh, really basic, I just drew this you know, very simple building structure down here, uh, kind of setting the scene for uh, where these you know, consoles live. You kind of want to set up an establishing shot of what world you know, you're going into. So there's like all these you know, lights and it's pretty rough, but you get the general idea. Um, and then I did a few other things where I've got these clouds as individual layers that move back and forth. Um, I've added a texture over top of everything. So this was without the texture. It's a very flat, um, basic look. But then when I add this texture, if you've seen other tutorials, you will notice and recognize this uh, same watercolor texture that I use for so many different things. And uh, I just did a blend mode over top of it, over top of everything to give it this nice watercolor kind of handcrafted look that I think uh, makes it feel a little bit more alive. And then I basically redrew the title in an OK Samurai cartoon byline um, three times a piece uh, all in the same spot. So here's number one and then redrew it again and number three. And then I just cycled uh, through those later on, whether in character animator or After Effects or something like that, to give it this kind of live kinetic uh, look. And I want to use this as an opportunity to point out with your different video elements, you always want something in motion. So I'm not just gonna export this as a still image and put this at the first three seconds of my video. Instead, I want to have a lot of movement. So that's why I have the tight moving, you kind of feel like you're zooming in to the city, the clouds are moving, um, all these different things that keep momentum in the video. You always want a sense of momentum. You always want motion and to move the the, um, the viewer forward because if this is just static, uh, in the world of video, that gets boring really, really quickly. So you always want at least something moving, something catching the user's eye. And for, you know, it can be subtle. In the case of this, all the movement is very slow, very methodical, um, but that's okay. It's kind of setting the pace and setting the tone and drawing the viewer in. For the credits, I took the exact same scene um, and just moved the clouds over to the side. Uh, for YouTube, this is where I'm putting, you know, suggested videos and a subscription, uh, you know, call to action and all that stuff. So I wanted to make room for that. You could also, you know, people add little videos of themselves talking, hey, thanks for watching my video, like and subscribe, you know, whatever you want, you could put in this element, uh, this area over here. But um, I do think it kind of adds a nice professional quality to add some credits at the, at the end, give credit for the music, give credit for or um, the people who helped you with voice acting and all of that stuff. Um, it just kind of feels like it ties everything together. Next up, let's move on to environmental art. So uh, this is the world that the characters live in. So I drew this in Adobe Fresco and I tried to give it a lot of nice little details. So if you know your way around video games, you'll recognize a lot of these little pictures that they have on the wall, the Triforce, Atari logo, Pac-Man, Mario, Master Chief waving and Kratos there. And then there's uh, you know some, some different little small things here. There are Cheerios and rice grains and uh, they've even got a grocery list on here and uh, you know a sketch of them on the refrigerator so just small little details like that that help give the environment a little bit of life and character. Now, two main things I want to point out here. Number one, uh, the whole background has kind of a muted quality to it. So I brought down the opacity on the stroke, on the line art um, that's around everything. I, I added an overlay that kind of desaturated the colors a little bit. And the reason for doing this is you don't want the background to compete with your characters too much. You really want the characters to stand out. So take a look at a scene like this from Netflix's BoJack Horseman. You notice the characters, very uh, strong, you know, uh, line art and uh, the, the drink even also in this bag. They're all in the foreground, the phone, the chair. All these have a great level of detail. But the background, um, all of the, you know, you can see a few little details there, but you notice it feels much more muted. And this really helps bring the characters out to the forefront a little bit better. So
So it's a bit of a balancing act. It's a bit of a trial and error. You can try different techniques with the colors, with overlays, with transparency, and see what works best for you. A lot of times what I'll do is bring in these placeholder characters, something like this, so I can have a general idea of the sizing and relationship between the characters, and then I can also see how uh, how strong, uh, you know, pronounced the characters versus the background are and uh, make adjustments based off of that. The next thing I wanted to point out is that the background is not just a flat piece of artwork that the characters are just slapped on top of. When you're thinking of your background and the world the characters are living in, you want to create a sense of depth. And that's why, you know, I've got this counter, for example, was a separate element that I drew. And it's something that I was able to put the PlayStation character behind. So, you know, when his arm and his body and all that stuff move behind here, you see he doesn't even have any legs. I didn't need to draw them because he was going to be hidden behind this the whole time. Um, it just creates this nice sense of depth. And the same is true of these other elements. So I've got these foreground elements, this plant over here, and this little table with uh, flowers on top of it. And I use these a few different times in the project to, uh, for the initial establishing shot that's zooming in to the whole thing. And then when Switch walks in, uh, the plant kind of moves to the side to again, it's a very subtle thing, but it creates a sense of depth and makes the room feel like it has a certain amount, a certain size to it and a certain quality to it. And it's not just this flat piece of artwork. And finally, for props and special effects and things like that, um, you can, you know, these can come from a variety of sources, either you're hand drawing them, find them online, uh, you know, buying resources from different stock sites, that sort of thing. Um, you might notice there are a few instances where there are these little subtle effects like this smoke poof when Switch uh, jumps up uh, to hit the block and uh, when PC comes in and out, there's a little smoke poof as well. So for example, here's a 10 frame sequence of smoke that I found of the smoke kind of rising in the air and then slowly dissipating. And it's just a nice little effect that you could overlay on top of your animations to make it feel uh, slightly nicer. So when you're searching for this stuff online, look for you know ping sequence or sprite sheet or terms like that of these animated sequences um, that you should be able to bring into your project. And they'll come in a variety of formats, but for me, um, I find it best to put them into a Photoshop file, kind of line them up layer by layer um, so you can integrate them later, either cycle layers uh, animations in Character Animator or just compositing them frame by frame in After Effects. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So this was my workflow. I did my artwork in Fresco and Photoshop primarily, but of course you can use Illustrator. Any combination of these tools or just one of these tools is totally fine. I did my mixing in Adobe Audition and all my exported all my individual uh, vocal tracks and the final mix. Then Character Animator is specifically for individual character animation. So not worrying about backgrounds or title screens or anything like that, just worrying about each character as its own individual scene. So with each of these, I you know Switch got his own scene, Xbox has his own scene, and then After Effects is the final step where I bring everything together and I put the characters into a background, uh, switch between different camera systems, uh, add shadows and motion blur and title sequences and all of that stuff. Now I did want to mention there is a way to completely skip that After Effects step. So if After Effects just scares you to no end and you want to kind of see what you can do all inside Character Animator, it's totally possible. You could uh, composite everything into a scene in Character Animator, all your characters and background elements and foreground elements and whatnot, and then use Character Animator's built-in camera system to keyframe uh, different hold shots and close-ups and pans and zooms and all of that. And you know what? I would say for simple projects, this is totally fine. If you don't want to go overboard and you just maybe have, you know, two characters in a single static scene talking to each other, uh, I think this is a perfectly fine route to take. But at the end of the day, Character Animator is not really a compositing tool yet, right? It is not the uh, almost 30 year uh, behemoth that an industry standard that After Effects is. So I feel like you just get a lot more bells and whistles and professional quality stuff if you add in the After Effects step. I also think it simplifies the workflow so you can really focus on just your character animation in Character Animator, which is what it's really been streamlined and optimized to do, and then focus on uh, the compositing and motion graphics and bringing everything together in After Effects, which is what that's been optimized to do. So that's the way I do things. Other people will bring in uh, Premiere Pro into the mix, which uh, dynamic links with Character Animator and uh, After Effects as well. So that's just another thing you could do if you want to add some editing components to it. Uh, but for me and uh, the way that I did this, this three minute piece, uh, this was my workflow. 
All right, so let's go jump into Character Animator now. And uh, I just want to preface this with, I'm not going to dig into the rigging process that deep in this particular uh, tutorial because I've covered that really extensively in a lot of other tutorials, specifically about each of the possible tools that you can use to bring uh, characters to life. So um, if you have no idea what you're doing with rigging and you want to start uh, getting instruction on creating uh, your own characters, I would highly recommend checking out one of these videos, either the Adobe Fresco, Adobe Photoshop, or Adobe Illustrator videos. Each one of those is going to go into excruciating detail about how to put a basic character model together. But if you're interested how I put my characters together, guess what, they're all free. So all of these characters, all the robots, uh, all four of the robots, as well as the background and the title and credit screen images, are all available for a free download at the OK Samurai Puppets page. So at the time of this recording, they are in the very first slot up here. Just click download and you can use them however you want. No credit necessary. Uh, feel free to take them apart, make your own, uh, you know, fan fiction, unauthorized episodes. Uh, I don't care. Um, just have fun with them and learn from them. Um, so let's say you've created, you know, three or four puppets and you bring them into Character Animator and you start putting them into individual scenes. So each character is going to be a little bit different, um, you know, the way that they work. This guy has some physics on his antennas up there. His mouth is a nutcracker jaw. Um, he's got a bunch of different triggers I can add to him, but it really doesn't matter, you know, how simple or complicated your puppet is. Um, it could just be puppets from the example screen, right? You could just make a cartoon with any of these characters and that's totally fine. Um, it's all up to you and your comfort level and uh, you know what, what you've created. But for each character, this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna add it into its own scene. So I had my Xbox character here and uh, with it selected, I would click add to new scene to make sure it's in its own scene by itself. Now, because I know I'm gonna bring this to After Effects later, I want this to be as high resolution as possible. I don't want this to be scaled down at all. So while I was going through the rigging process and just testing things out, I'd scale this guy down to 50%. I don't want that. I want him to always be 100%. Now he's way too big for the scene now, but that's okay. I'm going to select my scene and just make the height a little bit bigger so nothing is getting cut off. And you wanna give yourself a little bit of extra buffer room here so you know the head and the arms and the antennas, nothing's gonna get cut off the edges. I have a full resolution character now that I can do a performance with and know that when I bring it to After Effects later, um, there won't be any uh, distortion or pixelation or anything like that. Now, sometimes you may have a character that has multiple states. Um, I think there's a desire sometimes to just cram everything into one puppet file, add the walking, add the sitting, standing, all these different variations into one puppet. And personally, I think that just makes your character exponentially more complicated and uh, sometimes behaviors compete with each other. So for example, in the walk behavior uh, with a walking character, you know, the arms are moving with walking, but then you may also want to drag them and move them with a standing or sitting character. So to me, it makes more sense to uh, split your character into multiple puppets uh, for different instances. And that's exactly what I did with the switch character. Uh, for him, he has, a, he has three different states. He has a standing, a sitting and a walking state. Now the standing and sitting are pretty similar. Um, it's just really the, what the legs are doing. So I just made a leg trigger swap set um, to change that. So notice he's in his sitting position where he is for most of the cartoon. But when I press the Z key, he's in his standing position. So all I did was change uh, leg artwork, put that into a swap set. And so I can very easily switch between those two states. Now for the walking scene, I really want that to have enough space in the scene so he can walk all the way across from one side of the apartment to, to uh, around the couch area and uh, just give him a little bit of a runway to do that on. So uh, for this scene, I've got, I think it's 7,500 pixels wide, something like that, depending on how much your character is walking, you may have to uh, make it even bigger, but uh, this type of thing works well for the walking character. So I would highly recommend to resist the urge to throw everything into one puppet. If your puppet uh, you know, has a frontal view, a side view, a uh, standing, sitting, um, walking, all these different things, consider making life a little bit easier on yourself and separating into multiple puppets. I think it will, and we'll talk about how I do it here and I just think it'll make your life a lot easier. So let's get into recording and editing now. I'm gonna take every character, uh, you know, one step at a time and kind of walk through them until I've got all my performances all set up and uh, ready to bring in and composite in After Effects. So 
I always start with the audio. That's the first step. Everything else in the animation is driven from what the character is saying. I don't know what emotions or how the character will be acting if I don't know what they're going to be saying at any given time. So you want to import those isolated audio tracks that we did before. Um, and I would just, you know, file import to bring them in here. And I would find my Xbox lip sync. And I'm just going to click and drag it over top of my scene to add it to this character in this scene. Now this robot character is a little bit different, right? His mouth is not the traditional uh, swapping lip sync mouth. Uh, it's the nutcracker jaw uh, behavior, and that's a different way to do a mouth. It's totally fine. Um, but the lip sync uh, an analysis will work the exact same as if you were doing traditional lip sync. So if I have him selected, I'm just going to go to timeline, compute nut nutcracker jaw take from scene audio, and that's gonna go through the analysis process and really analyze the amplitude, the volume of the audio and determine uh, when the jaw is moving up and down based off of that data. And so once that's complete, you'll see now I have a Nutcracker jaw audio input take down here. And if I play it back, Oh, hey, PlayStation, what's up? You'll notice the mouth is moving. Now, if it's moving a little bit too much, I can always uh, change the uh, audio flappiness parameter, one of my favorite parameters, uh, down to something like 75% and see how that goes. Because you don't want it to go too far because you can see if the jaw goes beyond a certain threshold, um, it's going to go uh, you know, off the face. So you don't want to do that. So three out of the four robots actually do have this nutcracker jaw style setup, but um, the more traditional route to go is what Switch has, which is a uh, mouth with a lot of different shapes that it's going to swap between um, automatically as I'm talking. And so if I did that exact same process of selecting my character and going to timeline, compute lip sync, take from scene audio, it's going to give me all these little mouth shapes down here. These are called visemes. And so if I play this back. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. I can see each of the little mouse shapes uh, appear down here. And if I wanted to edit them, I can disarm my puppet. So I'm not seeing any new live data coming in. In fact, at this point, I should probably turn off my microphone because I don't need it anymore. There's no reason to bring in any new audio. It's all pre-recorded. Um, so I but if I press plus a few times, I can really dig in here and say, oh, you know, that M uh, doesn't need to be in here. That's kind of leading the whole thing. Or this E sound, if I right click this, I need this to be an uh sound instead. Or, you know, I can drag uh, the different parameters back and forth. So or I want this S to show up a little bit later. So let's drag that around. Um, so you have full control over how the lip sync is looking. So if you're doing this type of lip sync, which I would say 95% of projects usually do, um, you would want to now go through the lip sync and just do a pass and make sure uh, the mouse shapes are more or less looking correct. So I would just play it back and then stop it and make small edits here and there. So let's just try this little scene, for example. Or PlayStation, when you refuse to cross play with us, so I noticed when he said PlayStation, did you see that his mouth really didn't move that much? It, it just kind of was stuck in one position. Or PlayStation, when you... So that really stands out as a problem, right? I'm, I'm by no means a lip sync expert. Um, there are people who are much more skilled in this than I am. What I'm looking for at this stage are the big mistakes, things where a mouth is being held when there are multiple syllables, multiple vowels being said. Um, and I want to make sure that at least there's a little bit of a you know rise and fall of the mouth to at least give the illusion that the mouth is moving during those parts. I might not always 100% of the time line up the, uh, you know, the exact right mouth at the exact right time, but at least I have the option of making it look a little bit more in line with what's being said uh, as certain words and syllables are, are going. So if I play kind of scrub through this, so stay shun. So what I would do here is select this area, go to edit split, and that's going to give me a new place to make uh, a new visim. So I know station. So that's probably an A sound, an ah sound. Uh, let's try that at least. Play sta station. Play station. So over here. So I'm probably going to do more of a U sound again. I'm really trying to just hit the main vowels, the main syllables. And by the way, I just shortcutted the edit split. It's a uh, Shift uh, Command D on Mac or Shift Control D on uh, Windows. It's just saying you'll. you'll if you're doing this a lot, it'll it'll help a lot um, to, to learn that shortcut. And then I'll right click it. And let's say that's the uh for PlayStation. And then maybe I wanted to stop right here. So let's split it there. And then I don't need these extra visims that look like they got picked up. So let's uh, actually right click and go to silence, which is gonna leave a gap here for these ones. 
and finish this a little bit more. So let's see if this looks any better. Uh, or PlayStation, when you... So that looks a little bit better. I could, of course, finesse and, and move the, the lip sync around, but I just wanted to give the general idea of that's the type of thing that I'm looking for. Extra visemes that you don't want, delete them or uh, change them to silence. And where there are, you know, when there's a long visim that's being held and you want to split it up into multiple parts and make sure that you're hitting each of those different uh, sounds that the character is saying. So now that we've got the lip sync out of the way and we, we've got kind of an audio track to work against, let's start focusing on other individual elements. What we're gonna do is kind of record one piece at a time and slowly build up a performance by combining all these different elements together. So I'm just gonna start today with the arm motions. Um, so I'm gonna disarm everything else and the way I do that is hold down Command on Mac or Control on Windows and click one of these red dots and now everything is turned off. Everything is disarmed so no new live data is coming in. Now I want to only arm Dragger and th that means the only thing that's gonna be active right now are not the eyes or the eyebrows and the mouth or anything, it is just going to be dragging the arms around. So we're gonna start by setting a default position for our character. We probably don't want our character to look in this traditional A-frame position with their arms out like this. We want them to uh, have them to their side or hands on their hips or something like that. What do you think is going to be the rest position? So go all the way back to the beginning of your uh, project and then drag the arms wherever you want them to be. Let's say something like this. I think I want his arms down on his side, maybe a little bit bent, something like that and uh, that's looking pretty good. And when that's done, I'm going to go to Timeline Record Two Frame Take. Now I could also press the record button and just wait a couple of seconds, but Record Two Frame Take is just an easier process. There's no countdown, uh, although you can turn the countdown off before recording. Um, it's just a quicker method to allow you to uh, quickly get something recorded when you know there's not gonna be a lot of changes. Like if this character was waving or something like that, yes, I would want to press the record button, but if they're just holding a single pose, the record two frame take, and particularly the shortcut, Command 2 on Mac or Control 2 on Windows is going to be a lot quicker. So let's go ahead and do that, record two frame take. And if I zoom in really closely by pressing plus here, I will see that I've record, recorded two frames of animation where the hands are by the sides of the character. Now right now I'm not seeing it because uh, the character is still armed live for recording. So when I turn a uh, disarm that character, I'm gonna only see what's in the timeline. So if you only wanna see what's in the timeline and not be looking for new live data, just turn the red dot off of the character in the timeline and you will only see recorded stuff. So now I just need to drag this all the way across the uh, the whole timeline. This is kind of my foundational layer. This is the you know my safe default view that I know I can always go back to if the character uh, is is not doing anything else with his hands. And now I'm just going to listen to the audio track and make gestures based off of what the character is saying. Right now, I'm only worried about the arm movements. I'm not really worried about the hand positions and things like that. I only want to focus on where the arms are going. And I want my arm movements in general to be pretty quick. Um, one of the telltale cases of kind of amateur am animation is when things happen really slowly and you know, hi, I'm this character. And then the arm goes back down slowly. Um, in more traditional animation, uh, 2D animation, you see quicker gestures. Uh, the arms move a lot faster and uh, that is also going to allow you to hide things like hand swaps and other things and just make the character feel a little bit more alive. So I'm going to arm my character one more time. Uh, Dragger is the only thing that's armed here and then let's listen to this part and see what this character says at this scene. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. Okay, so look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. In that case, I feel like my arms would be out like this. Maybe they would then drop down a little bit. So something like that. So what I'm gonna do is instead of pressing record and you know trying to drag in time with all of this stuff, I'm going to uh, just set certain poses and record them like that. So let's say, you know, look guys, I'm gonna start back, drag back to the beginning. And then he says, look guys, something like that. And then I'll do my two frame take, command two on Mac or control two on Windows. And now I've got that nice little two frame take. So maybe I'll drag it out to the end here. And uh, then I can use the little blend handles on the edge. I just do, you know, two or three frames really quickly to have those arm transitions move uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Let's see how this looks. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. 
So I think no reason for us to argue. Look, guys, there's no reason for us to argue. I think I want the arms to then move down. So I can actually record a second take of the arms down like this. And I do have to drag them even a little bit. Even if I want them to look like this, it's not going to record if I don't touch them. So I need to drag them just a little bit so I know um, that they're going to get recorded. So let's press record. Uh, actually, command two to do the two frame take. And I will drag these out something like that. Okay, and then I'll do the same thing, blend to the beginning and the end. In fact, I think I want it to end here, so I'm going to take this bottom take um, that I did previously and make that end a little bit earlier. So if we just look really closely here, what's happening is it's starting with my foundational take of, uh, let me disarm the character to see this easier, my foundation take of the arms on the side, then it's going to blend and transition into the arms being in their up state, and then it's gonna blend and transition into the down state, and then it's gonna blend back to the rest position like that. So I have three different takes here, um, and I'm just blending from one take to the next between these different poses, and when it's all put together, it should look okay. Let's try it out. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. Now this next part, he's talking to Xbox, so he probably wants to point to Xbox. So I'm gonna do uh, a pose where, uh, let me arm him again, and he's pointing. So I might bring the arm up like this, do a two frame take, drag it out. And then maybe it goes down again. So let's uh, you know have the arm outstretched like this. Command two, again. And maybe it, then it'll drop down to the side, so I'll blend there. So something like this. Xbox, remember in the 360 era when you were giving everyone red rings of death? Oops, I forgot to do the blend here. You can see it looks choppy. It, it looks very clearly choppy when um, you, you don't have the blends in there. 360 era when you were giving everyone red rings of death? And of course you can finesse it with, you know, how short or long you want the blends, whatever works for you. If you want to be a little bit longer, uh, go for it. So this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm just patching in these little arm motions and gestures uh, for the character to do. And actually, if I like a certain gesture, like if I want to reuse these two over and over again, I can just, you know, copy them and then down here, press Command V to paste them, maybe over here, paste them. Um, and you can just keep using the same ones over and over again or retime them so this happens a little bit, uh, you know, this starts a little bit later, this happens a little bit earlier. Um, you know, if you get those few motions over and over again, a point, uh, arm, arms out, that sort of stuff, you can just keep adding them over and over again. And it's a nice way to save some time. Now, as you keep doing this, you'll probably see uh, your timeline start to look like a staircase, right? With a bunch of different parts. Each track, each take gets its own line in the timeline, and that can make your timeline get vertical and really big and hard to figure out and, and kind of parse uh, really quickly. So what I tend to do is twirl open, uh, twirl up, I should say, my drag dragger behavior, so everything is in one line. And then I can still select individual parts and move them around as if um, I was in the uh, you know, the, the more extended view, but this is just a nice, more compact view and way to see things. And then if I'm not sure about something, I can always twirl this back open and go into it and, and understand kind of the relationship between the takes a little bit better. So now that we're done with all our arm movements, let's move on to triggers, specifically the hand triggers. But while I'm at it, I'm just going to do all the triggers at once. So I'm going to disarm my dragger behavior and move on to triggers and make sure I'm at the beginning of my timeline here. So this character, if I look in the triggers panel and you can kind of expand this panel a little bit if you wanna see it a little bit more if your character has a lot of triggers, um, he's got quite a few triggers and they're all set up as swap sets, meaning only one of them is going to show up at a time in that given set. So this makes sense for saying like the hand, for example, um, this right hand over here, I either want this hand or when I press five, it does a point or six, it does the hand flipped around with the thumb facing the other way. So I only want one of those to show up at a time. So that's how I'm setting up all my triggers. And if you need a refresher on that, go check out the triggers tutorial. The very first lesson talks about swap sets and how they're set up and how you can do something like this. All right, so to record a trigger, triggers are actually gonna work in a swap set very similar to the mouth shapes, the visims. So remember how I could like move those around and then right click them and swap them in and out? You can do the exact same thing with triggers. So what I'm going to do is go through all of my triggers that I want to record with, and I'm going to uh, activate one of them in each swap set. If I just pressed record right now, nothing would show up in the timeline because 
all the defaults are just active by, you know, by default. There's nothing, no new, no new data being recorded. So I have to actually activate a different trigger um, for them to be activated. So let's go to my lids. So this guy, just to show you what he's capable of, he's got a two for a squint, one for a kind of a half eye look, three for more of a worried look, four for a blink animation, and there you go. And then open is the default state there. For the hand, the right hand, I've got five and six for a point and a flip. For the left hand, I've got seven and eight for a point and a flip, a default. Um, nine is gonna do a sad mouth set, change the mouth to being upside down. Um, this guy actually has a bunch of uh, different eyebrow triggers. This is something different I tried. Usually the eyebrows, you tag them and they'll move with your own, your own eyebrows in the webcam. For this one though, I added a new transform behavior to each eyebrow and keyframed and created replays uh, out of each one to do uh, a few things. So T was the default, uh, Q is gonna move them up, W, E, and R. So I have a lot of different eyebrow states that I can move between. Don't have to do that, that's a more advanced thing. If you know what you're doing with keyframes and replays, Try it out, it's pretty fun. And then finally, I've got uh, two different leg states for this character. So I don't know if you remember, at a certain point, uh, the Switch character is standing on the ground and then he jumps up on the couch and he's in this more seated position. So I actually have a trigger for his legs to go from a standing to a seated position. So again, what I'm gonna do is just make sure at least one of these in each group is active. So let's do a squint. I'm gonna press two for that. Uh, let's do the point for this arm. Um, let's do the point for the other one, the nine for the mouth to be upside down, and uh, Z to get that down, and uh, Q for the worried eyes. Okay, so now every trigger is doing something a little bit different. There's some new trigger that's not the default that's been activated. And so I'm just gonna go to timeline, record two frame take, so there we go. So now if I look at my timeline in my triggers area, I've got each of the names of my swap set showing up here and the active trigger within each swap set showing up down at the bottom. So let's select all of these and expand it for the rest of the timeline. I'll press minus a few times to zoom out and just make it so it goes all the way across. So great, so now I've set up all my triggers. I have a foundation. And uh, the nice thing about this is now it's gonna be really easy to add swap between these different triggers in the timeline. So let's disarm uh, my character down here and let's drag to that scene I was working on previously with the arms um, where he was saying, uh, talking to the other characters. All right, so remember here, he's raising his hands and they're gonna be in a certain uh, position. So let's see. So right now they're still doing the default of the uh, the points, right? That's that's kind of what I had set this up. What I wanna do is hide the swaps, the art swaps between transitions of the arms moving. So if I select, you know, I've got my two dragger um, areas uh, twirled up here, but if I select these, I can see where that blend is happening, where I blended the take to go from the default position to the raised position. And when I go right in the middle here, right between this take, you know, right somewhere in the middle here, that's where I want um, to do a transition for the arms, uh, for the hand swaps. So I'm gonna go down to my right hand and click on the dark blue, that's the bottom version where the trigger actually lives. And the left hand, I'm gonna hold down Command and select those both at the same time. And then I'm going to go to Edit Split, just like I was doing with the, uh, the Vizims. And now you'll see I have a new area where I can change the trigger to whatever I want. So in this case, let's change the uh, right hand to default. Uh, actually, that looks like flip would be better. So you can just try this out really easily. And then the other one, I do think I want to be default. So that looks better. That looks like the thumbs are, you know, facing the correct way. They're, they're in the right uh, orientation there. And then he moves his hands down in a second here. I'm just kind of scrubbing through, making sure I get it right. And then they're eventually gonna go back down to his hips. And when that happens, um, let's see, this looks like the transition where that happens. So again, I'm gonna go to around the middle of that frame. I'm going to find the right and the left hand, edit, split, and I'm going to now right click and change these back to uh, where they make more sense, where the thumbs are faced a little more inward. So then in a second he starts pointing, I wanted him to point to uh, Xbox. So let's check out where that transition is. This is with only one hand with his left hand. So let's do the transition here. Uh, and I will press Command Shift D as the shortcut to uh, split. And that's uh, Control Shift D on uh, PC. Right click, point. So now he's gonna go into a point. 
And then if I scroll down a little bit more, he's gonna be more of an outreached hand, I think in a second when it drops there. So let's find where that one is. And again, the exact same thing. Take the uh, left hand, split shortcut, right? And let's do, uh, I think it's, yep, it's default. It's always the one that you don't think. So I can go and play this back, but then check out all the other hands are kind of in their default positions before this. So I'm gonna change uh, like the right hand, uh, that should probably be default. Um, the left hand before here should be flip, I think. The lids, I want to probably have that open, so let's change that to open. And uh, the mouth, uh, I do think I want him to be sad at this point, so I'm just going to uh, make sure that's split and then make his mouth happy before this, the regular mouth, not the alt mouth. And finally, the feet, uh, I do want those to, for the most part, be the sitting position, so I'm gonna change that. So you can see how easy it is to really quickly change a character's expression with all of these different triggers. Now, I tend to do one at a time, so I'm just focused on the hands for right now, then I'll move on to the eyelids, then I'll move on to the mouth, then I'll move on to um, you know feet or eyebrows or you know whatever other things I want to do. But it's a pretty easy process to kind of pinpoint exactly when these triggers are happening. So let's take a look at how this turned out. Look, guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. Xbox, remember in the 360 era when you were giving everyone red rings of death? So the nice thing is those hand positions, those transitions, they happen when the arms are moving. And so you really don't see that transition between the arm uh, going from one state to the next, uh, the hand, I should say, going from one state to the next, because the motion of the arm is kind of hiding that transition. So that is always how I do things with these hands. I just find where the blend is happening, somewhere in the middle, that's where I'm doing my transition, and uh, it usually works really well. So let's say I go through the whole piece and get all my hands looking the way I want, then I would move on to other triggers. So for this character, you know, the mouth, for example, he start, kind of starts out kind of unhappy. Look guys, we all make mistakes. And then maybe he's a little bit happier about it. So I'm going to add a split there, uh, command split or command shift D, uh, and then I'll right click and do the happy mouth. So he'll transition. Going from a sad to a happy mouth set really adds a ton of emotion to a character. I've shown this in several tutorials before. I can't uh, recommend it enough. I really think it's important to have that two mouth set thing if you have a lip sync mouth like this. And then same thing with the lids. So, you know, I think he would probably be squinting when you first say, hey, look guys, there's no time, you know, why are we all getting upset at each other? So I'm going to change this to squint. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. And then maybe he opens his eyes a little bit more. We all make mistakes. And then another one here, maybe he goes to half. I just try things out. I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. I just think of, listen to what's happening and uh, hear the emotion of the scene and what's, what, like, what I think I would be doing with my eyes and just try to change it for the character. And you notice it's a lot of changes, right? Like the character changes his expression, uh, whether it's the eyes or the mouth or the hands or something like, every second or two, right? There's a lot of different emotion happening here, and that helps the character feel a little bit more alive. We see a lot of beginner character animator uh, projects where the character has just one happy emotion in their face, their wide eyes the entire time, and that's the whole thing. And I think it just brings your character to life a lot more if you're able to keep throwing in these little things, these little surprises, these little details, these little emotions. Um, and when you add, you know, the eyebrows and the eyes and the eyelids and the mouth and the hands and the gestures and all of that, it really comes together and makes for a compelling performance. Now there's one trigger in this character that I'm only gonna do once, and that is the feet changing position. So I know after he um, jumps up and hits the question mark block, that somewhere in here, I'm going to change it to the, uh, to the standing, st from standing over on this side, so that's the first version to the sitting version, and I'm gonna have him jump up and do that. Now, I don't know the exact timing yet. I'm gonna do the actual movement using keyframes in um, After Effects a little bit later on of him jumping up and then jumping on the couch. So for right now, I'm just kind of setting my best expectation for when I think this is going to happen, but that's the beauty of Dynamic Link. If I see something in After Effects that doesn't feel like it's working correctly, I can come back here in a character animator, make a few changes. As soon as I go back to After Effects, it automatically gets updated and I can make sure everything is lining up correctly. 
All right, so we're getting there slowly. Um, let's disarm triggers over here and move to eye gaze. So for my character's eye gaze, I almost always use keyboard input instead of the default camera input. This just gives me a little more control over uh, where my eyes are going. So when I press the right, I know my character's gonna look right, left, up, you know, two at a time to look diagonally. Um, and you have full control over how strong this is and under keyboard strength. If I turn this really far up, they're gonna go outside of the eyeballs, um, but I can turn this down as well. Um, sometimes, a lot of times I'll do like 75 or something like that. So they're not going right up to the edge of the, uh, the eyeballs. So this is one of those where I will press record and just come up with my best performance. Think about where the character's looking, you know, look left, right, up, down. Usually if they're thinking about something, I might look up into the left or up into the right to kind of feel like they're more thoughtful about something or when they're ashamed, they might be looking down. So I'm just trying my best to, you know, come up with where the eyes are, are going, but I don't want them to feel dead, right? I don't want, when we talk, our pupils are not just staring blankly into the abyss. They're kind of always darting all over the place and looking around. And to make our character feel alive, that's something that we want to do as well. So let's just try this. I'm gonna press record. Look guys, there's no reason for us to argue. We all make mistakes. Xbox, remember in the 360 era when you were giving everyone red rings of death? So something like that, where every few seconds or whatever, I'm darting the eyes around, I'm trying something, uh, having them look around in different directions. You can do it with the camera input, you can do it with mouse and touch input, whatever works best for you in your workflow. Um, and then I can, you know, make changes. If I want to patch in here, he shouldn't be looking at the upper, uh, you know, the upper side. He should be looking straight on or something like that. I can easily just press record. I'm going to hold down right instead. 360 era when you were giving everyone something like that. And now I've got a new take that's gonna appear above. And just like I was doing with the arm motions, I can blend that in to the next one. So the pupil will move smoothly from one position to the next. All right, now we're ready to move on to the last step, which is the face. So I'm gonna disarm eye gaze and move into face. Face basically means the head movements. Um, if you do have your eyebrows tagged, it would do eyebrow movements as well. It's gonna uh, incorporate blinks if you have that as a non-manual process. This character's blinks and eyebrows were both um, done uh, through triggers. And so that's a separate process for him. But you know, all of that is considered part of the face behavior. Now this character is a little weird because he's basically one big face, right? So his face and body are kind of the same. So the way that he's rigged, his whole body is kind of moving back and forth and pivoting. That's kind of different from a character like Xbox over here, whose head has more pronounced neck and it's gonna pivot. Basically, the, all the body movements and everything, it's all reliant on your head movements. Everything is kind of moving together with the head. Um, so in the case of Switch, it's a little weirder because his head and body are combined, but with other characters, their whole body is gonna kind of lean back and forth based on your head movements. So with my face movements, what I'm gonna do is do a basic take where I go through the whole three minute piece and I just move my head slightly, you know, so it's not just staying still, give it a little bit of back and forth sway. Maybe if I hear something in the dialogue that makes me wanna lean forward a little bit or lean back, recoil in horror, something like that, I can do that. But in general, I'm just trying to give this character a little bit of life and switching from one pose to the next. I don't wanna be moving all over the place all the time, that looks pretty amateurish. You wanna move more from pose to pose to pose every few seconds. So I would go back to the beginning of my piece. Um, I, tradi I typically will do slow motion recording. I'll do at least uh, three quarters recording speed, if, if not half speed. Now that means for a three minute piece, it's gonna take me six minutes to record the whole thing, but I find the animation is a little bit smoother um, in the long run. So personally, I usually will do three quarters or half speed. I'm gonna do half speed for now. And with Switch, I know he actually doesn't come in until later, so I can actually start a little bit uh, later on in the timeline and do my performance from there. And of course, before any face performance, you need to calibrate your camera. So I'm gonna get really nice and close to the camera, click set rest pose, make sure the tracking dots are on my face and press record. So you can see it's a lot of subtle movements. It's just moving your head slightly from one side to the next, giving the character a little bit of lean forward and backward to bring them to life. And uh, if you've done it correctly, then you should get this whole face take that shows up down here. And just like we were doing with the eyes and with the arms and all of that, if you see places you wanna patch other things in, just go to where that section is, press record and do a new face take.
So something like that. And to make it blend in with the previous performance, I'm just going to move those blend handles to make it look nice and transition from that first state to that state. So you're gonna go ahead and apply that exact same process to each of your characters. You're gonna do the lip sync, you're going to do the, uh, the arm movements, the triggers, the eye gaze, the face, all of these different elements in any order you want. Usually you lay down that foundational layer, that foundational track and take, and then you patch in other little things over top of it where you feel like it's appropriate. Now, I don't want to scare you, but this is what uh, the PlayStation character looks like. Um, this was his final version. So let's make my timeline a little bit bigger here and twirl open some of this stuff. So I've got, you know, all these different dragger takes where he is moving his hands around. Um, that's just one one hand, one arm, the other one over here. He doesn't move that one as much. Uh, we've got some different eye gaze takes here. So all told, I'd say this character probably has, you know, 150, 200 tracks, something like that here in the timeline if I twirled everything open. But don't let that scare you. Honestly, it's a, as I just showed, it's a pretty easy process and you put the level of effort uh, that you want to show up in your final piece. So if you just want to press record and just do one take for everything and get through it, you can totally do that. If you want to kind of fine tune and patch in a lot of stuff like I've shown here, you can do that as well. There's no right or wrong way uh, to do things. We all have our different styles of animation and uh, you know time constraints and all of that. So, so I could spend five minutes on this or five hours on this. And that's kind of the beauty of Character Animator is it lets you work really rapidly um, when you want to and it lets you really get in and have a lot of control and fine detail when you want to as well. So yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest, I would say each character probably took me, I don't know, well, the PlayStation and Xbox characters probably took me 45 minutes a piece to put everything together, um, which, you know, for a three minute piece to do all of that character animation within 45 minutes, that's pretty awesome. Um, the shorter characters like Switch and PC who aren't for the whole thing, those took even quicker. So um, all told, it was a round trip, you know, character animation of maybe two and a half hours, three hours at most, something like that. Um, and that's pretty awesome to say. And now that I have these characters rigged uh, and, and ready to go, I can use them in multiple episodes. So when I'm ready for episode two, three, four, I've already got the rigging and the triggers and all that set up. I just need to go through this process and uh, record new stuff for them. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be pretty easy moving forward. Now, for the walking character, remember Switch at the beginning of the cartoon, he comes in from the left hand side of the screen. He walks over to the couch and stops. And so I know what that timing is going to be. So I'm going to use position based walking in my walking version, my walking scene of Switch, not the sitting version, but the walking scene uh, to have him come in. So I've already recorded all the details here, um, the different eye gaze, lip sync, all of that stuff. And I'm just going to do a position based walk. So I'm going to start a little bit before he starts talking. And under walk, I'm going to change this instead to position based. Um, that looks pretty good. And we are going to now keyframe this by clicking the stopwatch next to position. That's going to change his starting position. And so I can drag this to wherever I want. Let's say he's all the way on the left hand side and uh, something like that. And then he'll say his line. And I want him to instead at the end of the line, move over to the other side of uh, the screen. So maybe something like this, I think, is about I'm kind of eyeballing it right now. I don't know exactly where the background is. I could bring in my background as a temporary uh, kind of placeholder to see where he lines up. But overall, I just want him to walk a short distance. I can check it out in After Effects, see how it's looking. And when I come back, uh, I can make some adjustments if I need to. But this is looking pretty good, something like that. So let's see how this looks all overall. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's all the hullabaloo about? So he's really working. He's moving way too fast there. So I think I'm going to slow him down a little bit. So let's have um, this start a little bit later and then let's not have him move as much. So I'm going to bring uh, the position back a little bit, something like this. I'm not going to have him move as much. Let's see if this looks better. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's all the hullabaloo about? So that feels like a good pace to me. So I'm, I think I'm going to stick with that. And again, I can always come back here if I need to fix it later on. So that's it for Character Animator. We're done here. We have all of our characters in each of their scenes uh, with their own individual audio tracks. Now it's time to bring everything together and we're going to do that all in After Effects. All right, here we are in After Effects and I'm going to do a new project. And uh, let's get started by bringing in our apartment background. That's kind of the big main background that I'm going to be putting everything else inside. So remember, I made that a Photoshop file. So I'm going to double click in this area over here. You can also go to File, Import, uh, File to do this. And I'm just going to bring in the apartment PSD. 
Now I don't want this to be footage, I actually want this to be a composition. A footage is just gonna be like a video clip basically. And no, this is actually a scene that has a bunch of different parts. So I wanna be a composition, retain layer sizes, create composition, and let's click open. Yeah, 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 click okay, whatever. Okay, so now I've got a composition, this little thing with the uh, circle, square, and triangle. And if I double click on that, this is a full composition. Um, and, and a composition is basically just a container to put everything else inside. So I'm gonna make sure I'm selected to fit here so I can see my whole scene. And if I go into my composition settings uh, up here, composition, composition settings, I can see how big this is. So my scene 6,000 by 2,500, I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's a good size scene for what will eventually be a 1920 by 1080 thing. I'll zoom in and out and kind of do some camera movements, but that's looking good. Um, you should also check your duration here. I know mine, my piece was about three minutes. I'm just gonna give myself a little extra buffer room at four minutes right here, but um, it's gonna remember the last, uh, by default, the last timing of whatever the last composition you did was. So you may wanna check this and make sure you know, you gives yourself enough time. Otherwise, uh, assets are gonna get cut off after this time and uh, you'll have to just stretch them out later on. All right, so now I'm ready to bring in my characters into this scene. So let's double click on the project panel over here and I'm going to find my Chaproj file, um, my character animator project file that has all my information in it. Uh, I don't need to create a composition for this one. Um, that's, that's okay, I just want these to come in as individual assets and I'm gonna click open. This brings up the dynamic link window, and this is gonna show me all my available scenes that I can bring in to my uh, composition. So let's start with the Xbox. He's kind of a central stationary character. So I'm gonna select that scene. Unfortunately, you can only do one at a time, um, but let's start with him, click OK. And there we go. Now I have this new little thing that has a timeline icon next to it that shows me that's kind of this piece of footage that I've brought in. So I'm gonna drag this over into my scene and uh, it should line up with everything else. So all of these are starting at the zero, zero point. I wanna make sure that my character doesn't like start later on because that's gonna mess up all the timing. So you wanna make sure it starts at zero, zero. And then I'm gonna place him into the scene. Um, so to do that, I can kind of drag him around with, uh, with the mouse, with the selection tool up here. And then I can also resize him. So I can either do that by holding down shift while I drag over here, or I can just press S uh, while the layer is selected to change the scale here. I can also press P if I wanted to change the position with these values down here. But let's do something like maybe 70% looks pretty good. Drag him onto the couch down a little bit, something like that. All right, next up is PlayStation. So let's double click, same process. I'm going to bring him in, find the character. That's the scene I want, okay. And the same method here, drag him into the scene and let's resize him. Now remember, he's gonna show up behind the counter, so I need to worry about my layer order here a little bit. So uh, luckily, because this was a Photoshop file, my initial apartment, I can see all my different elements, the flower table, the plant, and the counter showing up down here. So I'm gonna select all of those and drag them in front of my characters to kind of sandwich them in between. And now you see the counter is in front of uh, my character. So it just feels like he's integrated into the environment a little bit more. So I'm gonna continue going through this process, bringing in each of these characters individually, um, and that includes Switch in his two different formats, the standing and sitting version. I'm gonna have them both on the screen uh, currently at the same time. I know that feels a little bit weird, but we'll take care of the transition uh, in the next step. All right, so there we go. I've got my whole scene and all my characters in their various states and positions showing up down here. Now, I don't need to hear their individual audio tracks anymore, so I'm gonna actually mute all of these by turning, toggling off the uh, volume icon, and then I'm going to double click and import that final mixed um, version of the, uh, the audio where I had the music and the sound effects and all of that stuff together bring that in, drag it into my scene, and because everything's starting at the same zero, zero starting point, everything should line up exactly as I would expect. Now, a word about performance. When you have so many of these characters, these assets on screen, you know, this is a huge 6,000 by 2,500 pixel scene. I've got five characters here, and it's only gonna get worse as I add things like motion blur and drop shadows and things like that. Things are gonna go move pretty slow. So for example, if I go, you know, here, you see it's taking a second um, for it to render out the frame and 
realize exactly where I'm at. And that's going to get really annoying really quickly if, uh, you know, I have to wait 10 seconds every time I move things around. So there's a few ways around this. Uh, what I normally do is bring the resolution down a little bit all over the place. So here is kind of your static uh, screen resolution. So I might change this to quarter or something like that. That's going to move and render a little bit quicker. And you'll see that, you know, the characters close up don't look great, but from a further away distance, it's, it's actually looking all right. So this is enough for me to make these basic choices from. Maybe later on in the process, I might want to be full fidelity so I can see everything as clear as possible. But at this early stage, um, I think this is totally fine. Same thing with the preview panel up here. So this is how, it, you know, when I press space bar, what's happening, I can change, uh, skip every couple frames, change the resolution to quarter, and that's gonna move a lot quicker. Now that's not gonna entirely get rid of the slowdown, but it's gonna move things a lot faster. And you can even make it, you know, skip every five frames or set a custom resolution, you know, where it's only every 15 pixels vertically. You can really make this low res, whatever works for your system and uh, allows you to be speedy uh, with the number of assets you've got. Um, I, I'd say do whatever works for you in this case. So now that I have all my characters into this scene, I can start blocking them out and uh, doing any additional animations or keyframes that I need to do. Um, luckily, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, they're mostly in the same place. PC, he moves in and out a little bit, but Switch is where uh, I really have to focus on because he's changing between a walking animation to a stand to a jump and then hops on the couch. So let's try to get through this together. So I'm going to press play and see what this looks like right now. Different settings. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's all the hullabaloo about? <laughs> so then he's walking into the scene, and at a certain point, he's going to transition into a standing position. So I'm going to figure out exactly where that transition is by clicking uh, the previous frame button here in my preview window. And it looks like right there is when he's going to change to uh, finish his walk cycle. I can see this a little bit better if I zoom in and uh, take a closer look. So he's still in his walk and now he's moved out of his walk. So I'm gonna use that as my transition point to move between the two states. So with that character, with that um, you know character emitter character selected, I'm going to hold down option and right bracket. And that, and on a PC, that's gonna be alt and right bracket. And that's just gonna trim everything in, basically bring the out point. So this character's uh, out point is now, um, this is the last frame where it's gonna show up. At the same time, I'm going to do the same thing for his new state showing up. And so I'm going to press option left bracket, and that's going to bring the endpoint uh, in. So if I zoom in really closely, you can see there's one frame here where both of these are showing up at the same time. And if I go one frame before, it's only going to be the walk. And if I go one frame after, it's only going to be uh, the standing animation. So uh, standing character. So let's bring our standing character down and try to line him up as best as I can. And I might need to change the resolution um, at this stage just to make sure everything lines up correctly, but something like that. I want to get it in the general area. And now with both of them here at the same time, I can get rid of the overlap and just trim back this uh, walk cycle. So it's going to go directly into that standing state. So let's try looking at this a little bit closer and see how this is looking. Uh, hey, switch. All right, so we pretty successfully hid the transition there. I mean, there's a little bit of finesse. I could bump them around a little bit and add a little bit of, um, you know, forward momentum. But overall, this is looking pretty good. Now, in my final piece, I actually hid this change behind a camera change, right? So later on, we're going to switch between some cameras and stuff. And uh, I focus on PlayStation talking and saying same to switch and hide this transition happening off camera. So that's the easiest, quickest, and dirtiest way to kind of do it. But um, in case you do want to do it in scene, uh, this is how I would go about that. All right, so next up, Switch is going to jump up and uh, hit an invisible block. So let's uh, zoom out a little bit and let's get to that part of the scene. Yeah, I'm just trying to get everyone's rent money this month. Oh yeah, no problem. Here's mine. And as soon as he does that, he's going to start doing a little jump. Um, he says, here's mine, and he jumps up and hits an invisible block. So let's take our Switch character here, and I'm going to press P to do his position. So I'm going to click the stopwatch icon. I'm going to say maybe here he's going to uh, jump up, so something like this. I'm just going to click and drag him straight up, and then maybe something like this. He's going to come and go back to his original position. Actually, even to keep it more consistent, I can copy this keyframe, uh, Command C, Command V, to paste it, and that's Control C and V on Windows. And let's take a look at how this looks. Here's mine. 
Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Um, typically with the jump though, I wanna add a little bit of easing to it. So I'm gonna select all of these, right click, uh, let's go to keyframe assistant, easy ease. I use this all the time for keyframes and this will make it look a little bit better. Let's try this out. Here's mine. It gives it a little bit of easing at the beginning and end of each keyframe just to kind of smooth out the, the motion a little bit more. And it looks like it's lining up with the uh, audio pretty well, but of course I could move these earlier or later if I wanted to, to have it line up and you know make the jump a little bit quicker, move the keyframes in next to each other. It's really a trial and error process. See what works best for you. Now in a second, Switch is going to jump up onto the couch and enter his sitting state where he remains for the rest of the cartoon. So let's see where that makes sense to happen. Hey Switch, how many teraflops have you got? So he starts, I, I can see around 53 seconds or 52 and a half, he starts to transition in the character animator file to his seated state. So let's get a jump happening here by again with position, I can go to uh, click this little uh, diamond icon here to set a new keyframe and uh, let's have him jump up on the couch. So let's move him up like this and now he's on the couch. Let's see how this looks. How many teraflops have you got? All right, so he's just kind of floating on the couch uh, and that's not gonna work too well. So what I'm gonna do is give him a little bit more of a, uh, a bounce to him. And the way I'm gonna do that is, see this little circle right here? This is a handle for the motion. This is gonna basically determine the quality of the line. If you've ever used like the pin tool in uh, Photoshop or after or, uh, Illustrator, you know about this, but basically something like this where I'm dragging it so there's a little bit more of a rise and I'll do the same at the beginning. So I'm just creating a basic jump curve right here. So let's see how this looks now. Hey Switch, how many teraflops have you got? All right, so that's looking a little bit better. I need to probably finesse it a little bit more. I'm gonna bring this in a little bit, make it a little smoother. Okay, so after playing around with it a little bit, just kind of dragging these little handles, I've got what I feel is a pretty nice arc. Uh, so let's see how this is looking. Switch, how many teraflops have you got? That looks like a pretty good jump, something like that. Now I noticed uh, even though he should be in this stationary state, as you play around with these curves, uh, sometimes you're gonna run into things where the character is gonna kind of bob and weave based on your, uh, because of what you've done uh, in other areas. So to remedy that, I'm just gonna click the in keyframe here where he's supposed to be standing still and say toggle hold keyframe. And let's see if this fixes the problem. Hey Switch, how many teraflops? And now he's standing still for that entire duration. So anytime you see your character accidentally moving around um, like that, you can just do a, a toggle hold keyframe and that should keep them stuck in one place. And if you want one nice little finishing touch, you could add a little bit of bounce when he lands here on the couch. So I could go a few frames later and just add this, uh, you know, kind of keyframe that makes him move up slightly. Um, and I might need to play with the, uh, the, um, the, you know, little handles for that, but something like this might give him a nice little bounce up that, that might feel like he's impacting the couch a little bit more. So it's a really subtle thing. I mean, you're probably, most people are not even gonna notice this, but How many teraflops have you it just helps him feel connected to the environment a little bit more. And so little things like that, little bounces, anticipations, reactions to things, I think can really help sell an effect well. So I actually did this technique a few more times at the beginning of the piece, PlayStation feels like he's walking in. Uh, all I did was just do some quick uh, position up and down keyframes to sell that effect. Hey Xbox. Oh, hey PlayStation. So something like that, just a little rise and fall to make it feel like he's actually entering the scene um, when in fact it's just him kind of hiding, bouncing up and down behind this counter. And I did the same thing with the PC coming in uh, at the end here. Me too. Hey fellas, can you keep it down? He just kind of swings in and out using very simple position keyframes. Now I notice in this in-between state that he's kind of in a blurry uh, motion. And then when he eventually settles down, he's looking a little bit more crisp. So when we do things in motion uh, in After Effects, a lot of times I add motion blur to the characters to make them feel uh, a little bit more uh, like there's a little bit more motion to them. It just feels a little bit more realistic. The way you do that is make sure this little blue uh, enable motion blur thing is on up here. So you can toggle that on and off to turn it on and off. And then any layers that you want motion blur to be uh, used on, just toggle this little uh, bouncing ball icon on it. So a lot of times I will just click and drag down the entire list and make everything motion blur just in case uh, it starts to move. Um, I think generally it tends to make things look a little bit nicer to add motion blur, but you know, it's an aesthetic choice. You can decide if you want it or not. I tend to uh, go overboard with it and I think it looks all right. 
Now, something else you could do to these characters is add shadows to them. Um, it's a nice little touch that, again, is going to add a little bit of extra depth to your scene. Definitely not necessary if you don't want to do it, but it's actually really, really easy. So let's take a character like Xbox here, and I'm just going to duplicate him um, by pressing Command D on Mac or Control D on Windows, and that's going to give me two layers. And then with the lower layer selected here, I'm just going to kind of press the left and down arrow keys to kind of nudge it so it's a little bit away from the character. Something like that is looking pretty good. And then what I can do is go into Effect, Color Correction. There's actually 500 ways to do this in uh, um, After Effects, but I'm just going to bring the saturation all the way down to negative 100 and the Master Lightness down to negative 100, and that should more or less turn it black. Then I'm going to press T uh, with it selected. That's going to bring up my opacity controls. And let's bring it down to something like, I don't know, 15%, something like that. And I can see, you know, this really nice little subtle shadow back there. I probably also want to add a little bit of blur to it. So let's go to effect, blur and sharpen, uh, fast box blur. And I think for this, I did a radius of five, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's just going to blur the edges and make it a little bit softer, a little more integrated into the scene. So it's as easy as that to add shadows. I can do that to all of my characters, add these little shadow effects, um, and I think it's just a nice little finishing touch. Now, once you're doing this, uh, things might get really slowed down, right? As I'm fooling around with shadows, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically duplicating everything. So I'm going to have like, you know, 10 different puppets on the scene at any given time. So if it helps you from a performance perspective, if you are just constantly running into uh, little loading bars and stuff like that, just turn all the puppets you don't need off um, at any time. I guess I should keep the counter on, but any puppets that you're not working with currently. So you can just focus on one element at a time, and that's going to help uh, save a little bit of processing power. Now, there are other little details that we want to add in. So, for example, the jump here uh, when he jumps in and, and hits the invisible block, that's as easy as just importing um, a PSD file or whatever images you have. So I made this Mario block PSD that has uh, a few different things. Let's just create this as a composition, retain layer sizes. And I'm, I'm just going to do everything directly in here. So I'm just going to uh, double click on my composition. I'm going to select all my pieces, copy them, bring them out and paste them directly here into this scene, um, just so I have them all as a frame of reference. And I'll just drag this over here. Looks a little bit small, so let's drag everything. I'm holding down Shift to constrain it and make it bigger. And then I can just do all my animation right here. So let's say, you know, the exact moment that I want him to hit this is uh, right around here, I believe. So let's have uh, this show up for just a second. I'm gonna use my same things I did before, Option, uh, left and left bracket or alt and left bracket on a PC to bring that up and bring all the endpoints like that. And I only want the question mark to appear for like one frame. So let's do question uh, for one frame and then option right bracket to end that and trim that in. Uh, and then the hit state should show up after that. And then I want the coin popping up. So I'll press P on that position and just have it slide up over a few frames something along those lines. Let's see if that's looking okay. So something like that, right? And then I can make it disappear. I actually hide when it goes off um, when I do a camera change. So I could just get rid of these by holding down a, or bring out the out points, I should say, by pressing option and right bracket or alt and right bracket on PC, and then they will disappear. So any little elements like that um, are really easy to bring in and out. Just import them, Put them in here, uh, trim them, keyframe them, whatever you need to do. Uh, I probably do a little bit of an ease there. Um, I'm just pressing F9 as a shortcut when you select to add that easy ease to make that slide look a little nicer. And that's really it. That's all that I'm doing with these different elements. So I was also talking about those little smoke things that you can add, little uh, you know special effects and, and things. So I have this smoke jump PSD right here. Let's change this to a composition, uh, say OK. That looks great. And if I double, double click and go into this composition, I see that my smoke jump is uh, all my frames together. But what I can do is I'm just going to trim this so it's happening one frame at a time. So I'm going to select everything, uh, hold down option and right bracket or alt and right bracket. And I'm just going to drag these 
So it's a frame by frame sequence. And there's some other ways to do this. You can import um, ping sequences and other things in After Effects, but this is such a short thing that I wanted to show how easy it is to do something like this. So now I've got this jump smoke animation that's appearing over the course of you know 10 frames. And so I can place this wherever I want in my composition. So I wanna do it as soon as he leaves the ground. I want to have this kind of jumping feeling, the smoke that's leaving. So I'm gonna drag this onto not the scene here, because that's gonna bring it, um, uh, that's gonna start it right at the beginning of the composition. Instead, I wanna drag it into the timeline and that's gonna do it right at the moment uh, where the, uh, the current time indicator is. So let's move this over here. I'm gonna scale it up a little bit, something like that so it doesn't look too pixelated. And uh, let's drag it under the switch because I don't want it to be overpowering him. And let's watch and see how this looks. So it's a really subtle effect, right? You blink and you miss it, and I'm already skipping frames here, so you're missing some of it, but you get the idea. It's just little things like this, little poofs of smoke, little um, motion lines, little effects like that that can really help sell an effect of a jump or a swipe or a leap or uh, whatever sort of things you have uh, in your animation. So just think about, are there moments like that that I can add these little effects to my to my scene to help um, you know cement these these characters doing specific things? So at this point, I should feel like I have a finished scene. Everything is lining up correctly. I've added all my little effects and props. The characters are in the right places. It's as if I had a you know really far wide shot and I'm watching the whole scene unfold in front of me. Um, don't worry about stuff like the prop movement and stuff, the foreground elements. We can deal with that a little bit later. But in general, the main action that's happening on this stage is looking correct. So if you've reached that point, now we can move on to cameras. Now, After Effects does have the ability to do cameras. You can go into Layer, New, and create a camera. But honestly, this gets a little bit too complicated for what we're trying to do. We just need to kind of change the scale and position of our composition, and uh, that's gonna be more than enough. We don't need zoom and angle of view and depth of field and all this stuff. Um, if you wanna do that and you're a more advanced user, you can certainly do that, but I find it's a little bit easier to do it this way. So I'm gonna take my apartment composition, my huge composition, and I'm going to just click and drag it into create a new comp into this composition icon that's already down here. And that's gonna create something called apartment two. So with apartment two selected, I'm gonna press enter and let's call this final comp, something like that. And I double click on this and it's going to be now what I'm seeing in my scene and a tab down here. Now I can go back to apartment and right now these are looking very much the same, but in a second we're gonna change final comp. Now final comp, what I upload to YouTube or Facebook or broadcast TV or whatever, is probably not going to be uh, 6,000 by 2,500, right? It's gonna be a more traditional aspect ratio. So with uh, this selected, I'm going to go to composition, composition settings, and let's change this to something like 1920, by 1080. And I want to make sure my frame rate and resolution, all that looks good. Great. Okay. So now I have a rectangle window into my world uh, that's the apartment. And if I press P, I can, you know, move this around and reframe this into a different way. I can also drag on the screen if I have the select tool up here selected. And if I press S, I can scale it and zoom in and out. So with these key, you know, with these tools, it's really easy to just reposition and do a bunch of different shots really easily. So let's set some keyframes to set up an initial shot here. So I'm going to press P and then hold down shift and press S. So I see position and scale at the same time. And I wanna hold with this kind of wide shot to begin with. So I'll click the stopwatch icons for each. That's making a keyframe here. And just like I was showing with switch, uh, staying in that same position, if I wanna hold a keyframe, I can just select them, right click and say, toggle hold keyframe. That's gonna change the icon to this uh, little uh, symbol down here. And that means that icon, that, that um, scene is going to hold until a new keyframe comes into view. So let's play and see when we wanna change our camera. Hey Xbox. Oh, hey PlayStation, what's up? So right around here is where PlayStation is going to start talking. So I think I wanna zoom in on him. So with this selected, I can now change and change the zoom drag the position, something like this, frame it like that. So that's looking pretty good. And you'll notice you get this little square, meaning that is a held shot. So now, here's how the transition's going to look, something like this. Hey, Xbox. Oh, hey, PlayStation, what's up? Hey, did you send in your rent check this month? 
And now I might want to switch to Xbox. So I can just drag over here, maybe change the scale a little bit, something like that. And now that's going to be the new held position. So it's going to look like this. Xbox. Oh, hey, PlayStation. What's up? Hey, did you send in your rent check this month? Not yet, but come on, PS. You know I'm good for it. And then I might want to go back to a wide shot. So now that I've got these kind of different shots established, I can just copy and paste existing keyframes. So let's select these, Command C to copy them, Command V to paste, and I can go back to a wide shot. And it's as simple as that. So all I'm doing is alternating between a bunch of different shot types. I want to keep the viewer interested, and as long as I don't just hold on one shot at any given time, uh, it's going to look okay, and it's gonna keep the viewer engaged. Uh, so, you know, if you really wanted to cheap and easy way to do this, you could just keep copying and pasting the same shots over and over again. Um, but really what makes the most sense is to watch the cartoon, stop it when a character is talking, when you think, okay, this, this scene is right for a close-up shot, or this scene is better for a wide shot, and make your camera choices there, all through just these really simple hold keyframes. So if you ever want to edit a keyframe value, the easiest way to go through them is with these little arrows here. So you'll make sure you're on that exact keyframe. This just lets you move between the previous and next keyframe. So if I say, you know, this shot, I want it to be actually a little bit wider. I'm going to do something like this. Um, and that just helps you because sometimes it's really easy. If you try to just pinpoint it here, you might accidentally create a new keyframe and then um, it's going to feel very jumpy. So you always want to make sure you're using these buttons to move back and forth between your different positions. Now, sometimes you want, might want a moving shot. So for example, in the final piece here, I do a pan from um, Xbox and talking to PlayStation. So let's see something like this. Remind me, how many teraflops have you got again? So right there seems like a good spot to start the pan. So I'm gonna turn both of these um, on. I'm just gonna click both of these to create a new keyframe. I'm gonna change this now to ease, easy ease, by right clicking and selecting that. Come on. And then I want to pretty quickly get over to uh, to the PlayStation. So let's do something like this, where I just drag, and you'll see it's creating a new keyframe for me. I might as well keep a scale keyframe, just I might wanna scale in a little bit, scale out. So let's see how this looks. So something like that looks pretty good. I probably want to add motion blur to this to make sure that I, you know, am getting that nice blur effect as the camera's moving. Um, but you can do this as much as you want and then go right back to, uh, you know, your different uh, keyframe sh uh, held shots if you want to. And I did this in a few other places. For the beginning of this piece, for example, I kind of did a zoom in. You kind of want to set an establishing shot, get the mood of the place. And so I did something like this, where it kind of slowly pans in as the character comes in and they talk, and then it's going to switch to that other close-up shot. So you can do little things like that. Now, to help sell this effect even more, I brought some of those foreground objects in. So let's go back to our apartment here, and I'm going to take uh, my plants and my flower table. I'm gonna actually cut them out of this scene. I pressed Command-X on Mac or Control-X on Windows, and I'm going to bring them into this scene instead. Command-V, something like this. And I'm just going to kind of fake where these things might be. So I'm going to, uh, you know, scale this down over here and the flowers were over here, bring them in, something like this, scale them down. And then I'm just gonna have them move out of the way kind of at a faster rate as if they were right next to the camera to just, again, give the feeling of depth a little bit more. So what I can do is uh, let's go around here to where this zoom in starts to begin. Now this first part is gonna be hidden from the credits so it really doesn't matter what's happening here. Um, there's gonna be a credit screen over top but in general, I'm starting my zoom a little bit before uh, the scene is actually revealed to the viewer. So let's take both of these here. I wanna make sure that they have motion blur on and actually, I'm gonna add some additional blur to them, fast, fast box blur, and let's do something like maybe three or four or something like that to make them feel like they're in the foreground a little bit. They're a little bit more out of focus. Our main characters are in focus and these aren't. And so then I'm just gonna press uh, P for position and S, uh, hold down shift and press S for scale. And I'm just gonna set some initial keyframes at the beginning of this. Uh, let's change those into easy ease, right click, Keyframe Assistant Easy Ease, or F9 is the shortcut for that. And then have them end um, something like this. I'm just going to uh, click over top of the, uh, the diamonds over here to add some more keyframes to them. But really, I think I probably want them to end a lot quicker. They're gonna get out of the scene a lot earlier than this. So I'm gonna make sure I'm on those frames. And I'm just going to scale them up slightly, each of them. 
So they're getting a little bit bigger as the camera comes and then zooming them off the scene like that and off the scene like that. Let's see how this looks. Okay, so they went a little bit too much to the side. I think I want them to go down a little bit more. Um, so I'm just gonna nudge them down here on these last keyframes. I'm just holding down shift while I press the down arrow key. Let's see if this looks any better. Yeah, something like that. It's a really subtle detail, you know, like eight out of 10 people are probably not even gonna notice it. It just is gonna feel like it's part of the scene, but those are the little details that are gonna help you um, really establish your world and characters and keep the, uh, the viewer's attention throughout the whole piece. I do this a little bit later on as well when uh, the Switch character walks in. He kind of comes in behind the plant that's in the foreground. So I just have that kind of keyframed to show up. He's kind of hiding behind it to begin with. And then that just goes off the screen at a slightly different rate than the whole scene is moving back and forth. Again, it move, if it's in the foreground, uh, it's just going to move a little bit faster than everything in the background. So you just have to play around with the keyframes, manipulate it and see what looks good to you. But little effects like this can really help the uh, add a little bit of depth to the scene. And then last but not least, you can bring in your uh, title screen and your credits. So I'm just gonna double click, find both of those. So I've got titles and I'm holding down uh, command on Mac or uh, control on Windows. And again, I want these to be compositions. Uh, let's create composition for both of these and hit open. Okay, so now I've got my different uh, titles and uh, let's make sure this is the correct uh, aspect ratio. It should be composition settings, 1920 by 1080, 24 frames per second, that's looking good. Same thing with my credits, should be because it's almost the exact same file. Okay, so now inside here, I can do little animations uh, for each of these to make them look interesting. So, so for the titles, remember I did this little like kinetic uh, art uh, tr type treatment where I have the type kind of always moving. So I'm just gonna uh, zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to take my layers and let's do like three frames, option right bracket. Uh, I'll show you what I'm doing in a second here and drag these and stagger these different frames. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna keep moving between the three drawn states that I have. So I did it once for the consoles and once for, uh, I drew three times for consoles and three times for an OK Samurai cartoon. And it's just gonna keep cycling between those. And so I can just take this, uh, you know, this sequence and just continue to duplicate it. Command D on Mac, Control D on Windows, duplicate it and continue this process. Select everything, Command D, bring it to the end there and just have it continuing to cycle. Of course, your title sequence may look entirely different, totally up to you, whatever you want. Just make sure it all lines up and there's no gaps there. And you'll get something that, you know, looks pretty nice and cool. And then in this, I also want to make clouds moving around. Let's add some motion blur to them. And then let's keyframe all of these. So let's start at the beginning and uh, add a position keyframe, have them start there. And then maybe 15 seconds later or something like that. The credits is only three seconds, so it really isn't going to be this long, but I can kind of show the path of where I would want them to end up and give them all a little bit different speed so they'll move pretty nicely. And then when we watch it, it's gonna look something like this with some nice little cloud movement. Now, I always want to have things moving, have a little bit of sense of, of everything zooming in. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a new null layer here, layer, new, null object. And I'm just going to make sure this is, yes, yeah, centered on everything. And then I'm just going to shift select everything else in the scene and use the pick whip tool to connect it to this null controller. This is just an invisible controller that I'm going to do some really basic keyframing on position and scale at the beginning and just do a zoom in like that and maybe bring it up a little bit. And if I like don't want the title to be zooming, for example, I want that to be its own thing, I could uh, get rid of that. So let's not make this connected to the null. Let's make that not connected to anything. And that way the zooming is going to happen, but the title is going to stay in its same general place. There's a few other things I did. I've got some lights here um, that I want blinking off and on so I can you know take those and change the durations of when they are appearing. Um, just little 
fun little details like that that give a little bit of life to the background um, or, you know, little little dynamic elements. And then I would do the exact same thing for the credits. So I would find, you know, make this uh, kinetic type sequence, make the lights go on and off, do a very slow zoom, uh, have the uh, clouds moving. Now this is a little bit longer. I think my credits I keep for 20, 25 seconds, something like that. So I would just make sure it goes a little bit longer. By the way, right now my composition is defaulting to like the four minute mark that I don't really need for this short sequence. So I can always shorten my time by going to composition, composition settings, and let's change this to something like, you know, 30 seconds. And that's going to be a little bit more manageable, a little bit easier to see my keyframes not be so far zoomed out. All right, so when I'm happy with those, I can go back to my main final comp scene here and just drag them into the timeline where I want them to go. And so let's have the title start something like that. It's going to do the zoom. And then I'm going to have it really quickly uh, dash away. So let's add a motion blur and a position and just drag it out of the way to reveal what's behind it. Select these, uh, right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease, something like that. And now I get a nice little title card that comes in and then gets out of the way and reveals the action behind it, something like that. And same thing with the ending. I've got them saying one last joke at the end. Don't forget friend codes, ugh. And then uh, we bring in the credits here, drag that into the timeline. Same thing, it shows up right at the beginning of the composition, so it's gonna start everything. And now I can change the final timing of my piece. So let's say I want the credits to end around, you know, 322, something like that. Let's go to composition, composition settings, and change this to the very final duration that I want. And just to make it look a little bit nicer, I could, you know, fade out if I wanted to. I could bring the transparency down, um, start it there bring the opacity down to zero. I've got the apartment behind it, so let's select that option, right bracket to trim that out, and then you would get a nice fade to black at the end. Maybe I add some ease to that. I'm showing a bunch of different things. I know I went pretty fast here at the end, but really, you know, every composition is gonna be a little bit different and it's really up to you to decide how far you wanna go with all these different keyframed elements. Everything I'm doing is really basic, right? It's just really simple position keyframes, scaling, all of that stuff, nothing too complicated. As long as you kind of know your way around position, scale, opacity, all of that stuff, uh, there's just so much you can do. And uh, as you learn more and more about After Effects, you'll learn there are other, you know, cool effects and things that you can add into your production. And this is an industry standard tool. I mean, this is something that major motion pictures are using uh, to do some of their uh, motion graphics and special effects and compositing. So, um, you know, learning this is a really helpful skill. Um, you're using, you know, professional grade tools to, to uh, create a cartoon. And so that leads us to our very last step, which is exporting. So I'm going to go to file, export, add to Adobe Media Encoder Q. So Adobe Media Encoder is a separate program that basically allows you to render out your video in whatever format you want. Um, the one that I normally do, it's gonna take a couple of seconds, but then your comp should show up here. I'm just gonna click on the preset here, and that's gonna bring up uh, a bunch of different options for me. So these are the settings that I use, H.264, uh, match source high bitrate, and uh, then I can call it, you know, whatever I want and check the, make my final destination. So let's just put this on the desktop. I'm gonna call it consoles, something that I can easily identify, save, and everything else is looking pretty good. This will give you kind of a preview of what it's looking like so you can move around through here to check it out. It might take a while to render each frame, but you can kind of get a sense of what your final piece is going to look like. And once that's good and that's looking all right, hit okay select your composition and hit the play button. You're gonna see a little uh, loading thing appear here for a little bit, and then you will see a little thumbnail of your, uh, your project being rendered out. And you'll see an estimated time remaining. Most of the time, this is uh, either wildly inaccurate or uh, it starts to move up and down. So I wouldn't worry too much about this, but you know, rendering a really complicated project can take some time. This is not saying that you're just gonna save and a couple minutes later, it's gonna be ready to go. It may take you know half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, depending on how long your project is, how many complicated assets there are. So this is the time to go grab a coffee, uh, go take your lunch break, whatever uh, you need to do. And by the time you get back, hopefully to be all rendered and you will love it.
Now, if it isn't, once you find out, finally finish and you look over it and you see some mistakes, it's really easy to fix. Just go back to Character Animator, make any changes you need to the animation, go back to After Effects, make any changes to the composition, the cameras, the effects, and all of that, and render out a new version. For consoles, I think I rendered out uh, probably three or four different versions of it before I was totally happy with it. I just you know, watched the video with a notepad, took notes of where uh, some of the mistakes that I saw were either maybe a lip sync mouth didn't look correct, or maybe there was a little glitch somewhere where a character jumped into place or appeared where they shouldn't appear. Uh, little things like that, and you'll notice new things on every viewing. Finally, I said, all right, four is enough. I'm ready to upload it, get it out there to the world, and uh, that's it. All right, that's it. Uh, somehow you have made it through an hour and a half uh, long YouTube video. You are absolutely insane for doing this. I don't know why anyone in their right mind would do it, but apparently you're that crazy to get through this whole thing. So congratulations, number one. Um, number two, I just wanted to end with this. I, I think the world needs more animation. I think animation is one of the best ways to tell a story. And up until now, the tools to create animation have been kind of locked up, right? They, you need to be an expert at animation and you need to take a really long time to do these things. And the tools to becoming an animator are becoming more and more democratized. And it's not just character animator and After Effects and animate in the Adobe tools, but it's all across the spectrum. There's animation tools on your phone, animation tools uh, everywhere that are becoming easier to use. And so I would say, you know, think about the stories that you want to tell and think about animation being maybe the best way to tell them. Um, whether it's making fun of stuff like video game consoles or the latest, you know, superhero movies or Star Wars or whatever, um, talking about current events or issues that matter to you, politics, um, politicians, uh, you know, whatever sort of things are on your mind and either you want to entertain people or inform or inspire. I really think animation is one of the best ways to do that. So that's my spiel whatever, uh, I'm delirious after an hour and a half of uh, YouTube tutorials and then further editing in and putting it all together. It's a mess. I don't re recommend it to anybody. But anyway, the usual thing I say at the end, uh, if you are making stuff with Character Animator, we would love to see it. So please use hashtag Character Animator on social media. That's where we will see the work that you do. And uh, the whole team sees that and we'll feature some of those in our community spotlight uh, videos. So we'd love to see that. And if you're running into any issues, uh, any problems with what I showed here, need further clarification or any other character animator issues, the best place to get help is the official character animator forums. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for sticking through and watching this whole thing and have fun.